the next case to come before us and the final case to be heard at oral argument today is In Re State of Elizabeth A. Banks, deceased. Both sides will have 15 minutes to present oral argument. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you let me know when you get started, I'm keeping track of the clock um, up here and can let you know if you're reaching into any of that reserved rebuttal time, at which point you'll be able to either proceed if you wish or stop and reserve the rebuttal time. Um, We'd like to do that, Your Honor. You would like to reserve some time for rebuttal? Yes. Okay. How, how long would you like to reserve? Five minutes. Okay. Certainly. The judges have read your briefs. We're ready to proceed when you are. And if you would utilize this front podium, um, and um, if you could stay behind the podium, that will assist us in we are recording these uh, oral arguments. And if you move from the podium, we often have a voice that is not attached to an image. Mm -hmm. Council, is that the same document that is from the record that we also received a paper copy of? Yes. Thank you. You may proceed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the court, uh, my name is Bruce Wick, W-I-C-K, uh, 440-263-6865, and I'm representing the appellant. son of the decedent whose estate is uh, here on appeal. The case uh, that is the appeal realistically uh, begins with the notice that Mr. Uh, Banks received uh, via certified mail in the impressive envelope of uh, 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 Richard Banks, uh, Lorain County Law Bill. And uh, we'll review that, uh, which is also exhibit to the packet submitted to you. Uh, as the court will note, this is a hearing on Appalachia's, that is Richard Banks, motion to distribute, to distribute in kind certain of the assets of this small estate. Now, it bears mentioning as sort of a preliminary to any discussion in this state that uh, this is a very small estate, and you wouldn't imagine an estate this size, uh, or you'd imagine that an estate this size would be handled by the release of assets. Uh, when uh, You might imagine that uh, for an estate this size, it would be handled by a release of assets and not by a full administration. Uh, their, uh, the real estate was uh, jointly owned by the brothers as part of, um, or as uh, a result of a, uh, a TOD I'll call it a deed for ease of, uh, ease of reference, where both, uh, each brother got a 50% uh, share. So uh, it passed on death, not via the will, uh, but via the uh, TOD. Uh, so uh, that isn't part of the estate. There was uh, some cash in the form of uh, bank accounts and uh, security, securities of uh, certificates of deposit 
Uh, that passed to uh, Mr. Earl, uh, Mr. Earl Banks, and also was not assets of the estate, uh, did not form any assets of the estate. Uh, in fact, it's difficult, it's more, it's easier to say um, uh, what was not than what, what was in this estate and uh, why it was handled with uh, a full administration. Uh, uh, and that is, um, as I say, a, a, a mystery to uh, us even now. But it appears that the only assets in this estate were coins and currency valued uh, at $3,900 and a, uh, uh, a small boat uh, valued at uh, $2,800 for a total of uh, approximately $6,700. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, we're here discussing uh, important uh, constitutional issues. Uh, uh, in that context, uh, which is uh, you know difficult to understand, and perhaps uh, as I proceed, the reasons may become uh, clearer. Returning to the notice, we believe that the notice of this hearing was fatally defective in that it fails the basic due process test in misidentifying the place. Uh, since we know uh, uh, from other things in the record that it was not an in-person hearing, but what one might call it a hybrid Zoom hearing in that uh, uh, the magistrate, who was apparently the host, and seated, seated somewhere in the probate precincts of uh, this courthouse, this uh, justice center, uh, he participated via Zoom and connected the other participating parties uh, by, in the case of uh, Mr. McLaughlin and uh, Mr. Richard Banks at, at uh, the McLaughlin offices in uh, Sheffield, or Sheffield Village, and uh, for uh, Mr. Earl Banks, my own client, he participated by telephone hookup uh, from outside, uh, from an outside hallway adjacent to the uh, probate court precincts uh, uh, inside the Justice Center where we're seated now. In fact, I think it's the very hallway uh, right outside these doors, although further closer to the elevators. Now, why did uh, Mr. Banks come here rather than uh, was he, didn't he participate from home? Uh, via the uh, phone connection that he obviously had because it was actually used here. Well, the notice instructed him to come here. It says quite clearly that the hearing on Richard Banks' motion will be held June 7th, 2021 at 1.30 p.m. In this court, in this court, and the court is located.
located at 225 Court Street, 6th floor, Elyria, Ohio. Now, when he got here, uh, the deputies told him there was nothing scheduled. Uh, we were at the time under the COVID restrictions, I, I believe. And, uh, but uh, when Mr. Uh, Mr. Banks, Mr. Earl Banks, brandished his notice. Uh, they, uh, he's a law enforcement officer whom some of the deputies knew. And they told him, well, go up and see what's going on. And so he did, and was told the same thing up here uh, by a deputy clerk, and that is that uh, the court wasn't holding any in-person hearings, but they were all by, they were all by Zoom. Uh, after some consultation, they offered him the option to proceed uh, by uh, telephone hookup. Uh, he mentioned it could be a complete hookup if he had the facilities on his cell phone to do that, which he did not. Now, he, he did have, had he received notice of it, uh, two adult sons, uh, uh, Mark and Eric, uh, Eric who is in IT, uh, I guess, uh, for some hospital consortium, that, uh, uh, you know, he could have utilized facilities that they could have made available had he known to ask uh, for, their, uh, for their assistance, but he didn't know. So uh, uh, the only way he could uh, meaningfully participate participate at all, indeed participate at all, is via a mere telephone hookup, which of course would not allow him to see the other participants, nor they to see him, but it would allow them both to hear each other, and for a certain of the participants, that is, Mr. Uh, Richard Banks and his counsel, and, yeah, to both see, see it here, uh, excuse me, Your Honor. That's okay, I'm sorry, I just... Uh, attorney Luke, I just wanted you to know that you are just now reaching into that five minutes of rebuttal time, so you may continue, but I wanted to let you know that you have reached into that reserved time for rebuttal, or you may well, sit down and reserve the remainder of your time. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, well, let's see. Um, Uh, why don't we um, reserve? Why don't I reserve the balance? Certainly. Thank you. start with, I think, what should be the focus of this court, which is the standard of, of, of review here. This is a plain error case, so the appellant's burden is not just to prove that there is some error in the probate court's decision, it's that the error is so egregious that, to quote the Ohio Supreme Court, the error seriously affects the basic fairness, integrity, public reputation of the judicial process, thereby challenging the legitimacy of the underlying judicial process. And the Ohio Supreme Court tells us that the plain error doctrine should only be applied in extremely rare cases where exceptional circumstances require presenting an egregious error. And this is not one of those cases. I think it's clear from the briefing 
and also from what's been presented at oral argument by the appellant that you cannot articulate any error in this case, let alone a plain error. I'll start with what he was able to, to discuss in terms of the notice and the Zoom hearing, the Zoom hearing itself. Uh, counsel does not argue, or appellant does not argue, that he was deprived of some right of attendance outside of being able to appear via Zoom. He appeared via telephone hookup rather than Zoom. Now, appellant will tell you that he was able to hear the participants, he was able to be heard, he was able to present argument. Indeed, he's, he's heard presenting argument and answering questions from the magistrate. So there's no there was no deprivation of any argument that he could have made or would have made had he been able to attend via Zoom. But he wasn't able to see. That's correct. He, he's not able to see, but there's nothing that indicates from the hearing itself that there were records that needed to be seen. And he hasn't pointed to anything that... Was, to he, able, any, was he able to know who was talking? Did somebody say, I'm the magistrate, I'm talking? Well, considering the appellee in this matter, the other party would have been his brother. He certainly knows his brother's voice. He knows uh, counsel's voice from, from earlier in the proceeding and as far as I know the, the magistrate would have identified himself when he's asking questions to uh, Earl Banks or when he's making statements about the record and so I don't think there's any kind of issue with his ability to know whom, who is speaking and I also think it's important to note that there's no real argument from the appellant as to how his how he would have changed how he addressed the court had he been on Zoom rather than by phone. And, uh, but there's no dispute he had no option of in person. Um, as, as far as I know at that time, I'm sorry, Your, Your Honor, at that time it was during COVID, so I don't believe that the probate court was allowing in person attendance. Now, I want to also address what is, what is raised in appellant's briefing in terms of his the denial of the magistrate's denial of his request for counsel and I think it's important to set forth a timeline here so the appellant is removed as executor in November of 2019 the hearing itself that is at issue on this appeal takes place in June of 2021 so between November of 2019 and June of 2021 appellant has time to secure a new counsel if he wishes to do so and the record actually that came from the appellant itself he shows communications between himself and former counsel that informed the appellant I'm withdrawing his counsel if you're concerned about anything that happens moving forward in this administration you should seek new counsel the appellant chooses not to do so he also chooses not to do so in May of 2021 when he receives the notice uh, of this hearing taking place he also chooses not to immediately after the hearing. The hearing takes place on June 7th. On June 11th, the appellant, the appellant requests the recording of the hearing and decides at that point that he's not going to secure new counsel. He's not going to seek to object to the magistrate's decision. It's, it's obviously important to reiterate that there is no objections filed in this case, not by appellant, not by anyone. And the decision not to do so should be fatal to this appeal. Finally, I think the, the final error that appellant raises with respect to the magistrate's decision relates to the Scrivener's error where uh, the magistrate vacillates back and forth between referring to Mr. Earl Banks as Earl or as Elmer. Now, I can't say one way or the other why that error was made. I know nothing indicates that it was prejudicial. Nothing in indicates that, anything, that it was anything other than an error. And this court presumes that the lower court's decisions were made without prejudice, and it's appellant's obligation to overcome that prejudice. I don't think there's that presumption, I'm sorry. 
and I don't think there's anything to indicate in the record or otherwise that would suggest that was done motivated by bias or prejudice. Do you think that bolsters his argument, though, that there was not due process here? That it was so informal the magistrate didn't even know his name? I don't think I don't think there's an indication that he didn't know his name. I think there's an indication that there was an error during the drafting process of the decision. He certainly starts off using Earl. I believe Earl's the first reference in the magistrate's decision. I'm not sure at what point there is a switch to Elmer. I'm not sure why that occurred, but I, I don't think that suggests that it's so informal or so prejudicial that he didn't know the name. And I also think there's nothing that would indicate that there were arguments that were ignored by the magistrate, presented by appellant, that would have warranted a different decision. Uh, and the same is true given his inability or decision not to object to the magistrate's decision. This is certainly something that he could have raised in an objection to the judge, but he, again, chose not to. I want to briefly touch on the errors that are alleged to have occurred in the magistrate's decision itself. I know in appellant's briefing he raises a number of alleged accounting errors related to the administration of the estate. I think at its core, an administration of an estate is just a division of assets. And so the appellant here raises a number of alleged accounting errors, none of which warrant reversal, let alone even being errors. I think the first one he raises in his brief is the personal Huntington account that has approximately $17,000 in it. Now you heard appellant, counsel for appellant, tell you that this is not an estate asset. And indeed, it's never put into the estate. There's no evidence that it was ever included in the estate. And so it's really a non-issue there. And the same is true for uh, the alleged advance that appellant made into the estate, uh, totaling $3,500. He claims that this was an advance that he had put into the estate to get it up and running, but there's no evidence that that money was ever made or ever came from appellant. Indeed, the cash on hand in the estate, if you go back to appellant when he was executor, his inventory, the schedule of assets, the cash that came into the estate came from a nursing home refund totaling $6,075 and life insurance proceeds totaling $2,861.27. That's where that money came from. There's no evidence that uh, that the appellant put any money into the, the estate. Now, he also makes reference to executive fees and attorney's fees and the what I think appellant is trying to argue is that he was not, he was deprived of some opportunity to seek executor fees. Again, there's no evidence that would suggest he was deprived of some opportunity. What it suggests is that he failed to do so. And, and really that is a, appellant's neglect is, is a theme that runs throughout this administration of the estate. That's why he was removed as executor. That's why he was cited several times for his inability to timely file estate documents. And, and so it's not an issue of the court doing something wrong. It's an issue of appellant's neglect. I do briefly want to touch on the alleged right to counsel. I think it's clear that uh, that there is no right in the civil context to be represented by counsel. There, there's certainly a right if you wish to retain counsel to do so, but there is no constitutional right to appear at a hearing with counsel if you have if you have failed to retain. And that's the case. Uh, that's for, that's the case in probate court, and it, all, it also is the case in civil trial courts. And that's that's uh, exemplified by a case that appellant cites in his in his briefing. Um, sorry, Your Honor. 
That's the Harding v. Lewis case from the 8th District, where in that case, the defendant's lawyer actually did not show up for trial. And one of his arguments on appeal was that I was deprived of the right to counsel. And the 8th District ruled that just generally finding that the right to counsel in a civil case is not automatic. It is not automatically prejudicial. And it's really the, um, the party that, was, that did not have counsel is their burden to prove the prejudicial effect. And so the issues that are raised by appellant in this matter do not show a, do not show error in general and certainly do not show an error uh, that rises to the level of, for the plain error doctrine to apply. So uh, we would ask on behalf of the appellant, uh, on behalf of the appellee, that you affirm the decision of the probate court. If there are no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney, you have um, four minutes for about. Thank you. If uh, your honors will turn to page 16 of the transcript of hearing. I think it illustrates better than anything I can say the plight of um, uh, Mr. Banks, Mr. Uh, Earl Banks felt himself in. About halfway down, uh, two thirds of the way down, beginning with his answer, I can't answer to the magistrate's questions. I can't answer anything because I have no legal advice to let me know what to answer at this point, okay? That's where I'm at at the moment, all right, okay? Just like I could have a continuance on this, enough to give me the, and he's cut off by the magistrate. No, this is a civil case. You're not going to continue this. It's a civil case. And here I would suggest respectfully to uh, the court that it's one plain error after another. I mean, there's scarcely a phrase that doesn't contain plain error. And uh, opposing counsel, uh, Mr. Bozak, says it's not here. It leaps from the page. This is a civil case. We're not going to continue this. It's a civil case, okay? So it's not a criminal case. The court continues. The magistrate continues. It's not a criminal case. You're not entitled to a court-appointed attorney. That's the first introduction of the suggestion that Mr. Banks was, suggest was requesting a court-appointed attorney, okay? Uh, but he's got it in his mind, uh, okay. It's the responsibility of each party to retain their own attorney, and if they don't show up, they don't show up. Unless the attorney comes forward and, uh, and said there was a good reason, you know, the attorney can't make it, you know, for the hearing, uh, let me to go back to Mr. Richard Banks. So that's, that's when he finally turns to an outright denial of his request for a continuance. Up to that point in the transcript, the whole thing I would commend to you, uh, your, your Honor's uh, respectful attention, but uh, this is the first time he's put him off successively, you know, let's do this first, let's do that first, even though normally, and what he says he did, uh, 
in the in the magistrate's decision is that he has it first, that he first ruled on his request for a continuance, but that's not true. That's not true. It was very late in the proceedings where he finally couldn't delay the confrontation anymore, and so this is what came up. And I think it's, uh, as I say, better than anything I, I can uh, uh, say about this case myself. I, I think it was uh, uh, a denial of, of, of due process and uh, uh, everything that should have happened is, uh, in, in this case from the notice uh, to the uh, closing gap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentations today. The court will take the matter under advisement. We will issue a written decision, which will be mailed by the courts, the new courts, on the day that it is released. It will also be posted on the Ohio Supreme Court website. The court is now adjourned. In